Uh, I'm going to start by apologizing to you because of my accent. I'm very sorry about that. I'm trying to improve. Uh, in fact, I just arrived to Stanford University, and so my strong accent again. And as Anya say, I'm Valentin Shorokov, also a PhD student in neuroscience. And I'm conducting my thesis on addiction, which I am going to present to you today. And before coming to you, I actually have done my homework for you. I've learned my statistic. And my very scientific conclusion is, we are mainly not abstinent, even abstinence room. We might, we might be smoking, drinking, using drugs, and I would say maybe even particularly us in this room. Because what I've learned is that the Bay Area has a higher rate of drug users than the whole California. And California itself has a higher rate than the whole nation. So that's quite a lot. <laughs> and actually, this number goes up to the roof if you consider legal substance such as alcohol or tobacco. So you will say that's okay, right? Because you know how to drink or to smoke. It doesn't drive your life. You control your use. Well, the problem is that, according to the same statistic, one person out of five who ever used drugs will at some point meet the criteria for addiction, which makes it 10% of your community. So let's try to take a moment to understand what is happening to this 10% of our population. Okay, believe it or not, the this drawing is actually a metaphor for the brain. And your brain is, as a road, composed of many parts that cross and interact with each other. And some parts within your brain will want you to go. This one. So this part within your brain is a reward system. And the reward system will send you strong motivation, strong goal signals towards some kind of behavior. And it's actually quite good to make sure that you survive that you want to eat, to drink, to make baby, to socialize. And so to ensure that you do so, it will send you motivations and it will reward you after that with dopamine, which we call the pleasure hormone. So it will make you learn the association between the behavior and pleasure to make sure that you will do it again and that you deeply anchor it. So that's why sometimes you're craving this piece of cake and that's why it feels good eating it. But then we also need to be wise. We also need a kind of supervisor within your brain to tell us when to stop. And this supervisor is the frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex is actually able to send you strong stop signals. It's actually able to use the previous reward to help you choose wisely, or even to delete the previous reward to make sure that you change, that you adapt your behavior. But then both brain and the stop brain system will be directly impacted by your substance use. It's actually really toxic for them, and indirectly by the choice you make, by the fact that you continue eating this cake. So suddenly the picture changed. You will not be able to stop if you see that. You want to go through, you want to continue using it. And since your brain loves that substance equal pleasure, this motivation will be even higher for the substance. And it will drive you in a vicious circle that you can't stop anymore when you don't have control, you don't have stop signals. So my point here is that addiction is way more complex than just don't drink. It's a lot of psychological and cerebral changes that are happening and it's out of our control. So what we need to do as a community is trying to help this 10 percent of people, trying to understand what is happening. So in the scientific field, we do that by trying to explore to go and to stop signals. What is happening just before you use something? And the biggest challenge of my thesis relies on how do we do that? And it's actually a question that's been ongoing in psychology for decades, you know. How do you know what influences your everyday actions? Quite hard. So the most obvious response will be, ask the people. So I could try to do it right now with you, I could try to ask them, have you been drinking lately? And if you're honest, and if you remember, you might tell me about this drink you had with your friends two weeks ago. But then, can you tell me what happened just before that? What caused it? Can you tell me Friday the 10th at 5.26 precisely? Where were you? How were you feeling? Were you happy, sad, how much? And I could even go further and try to ask you, how was your intellectual abilities back then? 
So you see the problem with these kind of questions, or you have an incredible memory, which is good for you. But then we needed to try otherwise. We needed your honest response, and where and when it matters the most. So we say, okay, if the people are here now, we could ask you right now how you feel. Are you happy, sad, bored? Hope you're not. And I could even test you myself to see your intellectual functioning. And I was used this to try to predict the fact that you will use again in two weeks, that you have a drink. But then we have another issue that is completely unrelated to your memory. Are you going to tell me that how you feel right now will not change at all between now and this drink you will have in two weeks? You're a stable person. You're reliable, right? You never change. That's our second issue in psychology, that we are, as humans, slightly unpredictable. And it's okay. But then we needed to find a way to get closer to you, to track your opinions, your mood, your desire to use a substance every day. So we decided to use a tool that was the closest to you, that everybody has, and is probably right now in your pockets, your smartphone. So we've been implementing questions and tests on smartphone and giving the smartphone to people with or without addiction. And what we found out is that we are even more complex than we imagine. Our mood, our desire to use the substance, those goal signals are constantly changing, rapidly fluctuating both within days and between days. And actually, the greater instability is also linked to greater chance of relapse of the fact of using again. And the patient that has the greatest instability are also the one that shows the greatest brain imbalance between those top and those go brain area. Which, need, which means that the patient that need our help the most are also the one we can detect with the very particular one-time point questions. On a more positive note, I've also been tracking the stop signals. Is what I found is that there is indeed a visual circle in addiction. The more you use, the more you would tend to use later again. But the integrity of the stop signals and of related brain area are able both to present, prevent this circle from happening, and break it if it happens, prevent you from having a second drink, even if you have your first one. So what we need to do now is try to translate these results into everyday actions. Because those stop signals can be eradicated, but we need to do it when and where it matters the most because 40 to 60% of people with addiction will relax with the year. But you also know what 80% of them have is a powerful choice, and it's probably right now in their pocket, a smartphone. And that's what my thesis is about. Thank you.